Oh, grace and peace, everyone, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who goes before us and calls us to newness of life. Good morning, church. Good morning and welcome. It is good to be together for this time of worship. I, I trust that you have all been greeted warmly and know that this is a church committed to loving God, sharing Christ, and serving the world. My name is Joel Gibble, pastor here at First Church of the Brethren. My goodness, it's great to be back. Finally, ministering before you again. Uh, thank you all for your prayers and concern, by the way. COVID is no joke, and it wiped me out for a whole week, and I am doing perfectly fine today. So thank you. Um, and coming right on the heels of some travels, I feel like this whole month of July has just disappeared, and I haven't really been with you. But it's great to be here today, and thank you for your presence with us. Thank you as we begin to all those who are serving us in worship today. Beth Ann Bond, our worship leader. Thank you again, Beth Ann. Rebecca Wolf will be leading our children's story today, as well as music. Uh, Becca Miller accompanying, and Christine Worman is our special music today on cello. So thank you, Christine, for sharing your gifts with us today. Thank you as well to the ushers, the greeters, the nursery attendants, AV team. I appreciate all of the service that you contribute to our time together. Everyone, who is in the pews, please circulate the attendance pads located at center aisle, as usual. Um, you will note the prayer request concerns if you have any, uh, the forms, if you have any joys or concerns to share during the prayer time, note that I will name them publicly. You may fill one of these out. Ushers will collect them during the first hymn. A few brief announcements, church, about the life of the church and uh, some things to note that are upcoming. Um, first of all, note that Vacation Bible School has been canceled for this year. I don't know if that message came through last week, um, but that difficult decision was made about two weeks ago. It's with some regret that we can't host this event due to some illness among leaders and, and low enrollment, but we have every intention of coming back strong next year with that program, so thank you to all those who had volunteered and were ready to serve. Um, in the gathering area, you will notice the the blue, little blue bank houses, Cornerstone Youth Home Fundraiser is coming to an end. So uh, many of you who took those little banks home this last month, please bring them back right away. We're now collecting them now that July has come to an end. And if anyone wants to make a contribution to support the work of Cornerstone Youth Home, please do so today or maybe sneak in tomorrow and do so at that house-shaped thing on the counter. Um, we just want to support this organization and knowing that we may and likely will be partnering with them in the coming years to even have a presence on our campus which will house children in need. Cornerstone Youth Home is this organization we want to keep before us and support. So thank you for your donations if you are so led. A uh, quick note, uh, two weeks from now, Sunday, August 14th, note that there will be a time for sharing about the Church of the Brethren annual conference and the state of the Church of the Brethren as a whole, we might say. During the Sunday school hour, we intend to have a combined class session here in the sanctuary, hearing from Greg Kleinenst, our delegate, and from me, we'll show the wrap-up video, we'll have a lot of question and answer, and time for sharing about the annual conference. So please come for that, everyone. I want us all to be well informed of what is happening in the Church of the Brethren as a whole at the national and even international levels. So I look forward to that time together. Also, please everyone note, if you haven't already, reserve the date September the 11th. That is a Sunday, and I want you to reserve that date because in the afternoon, 3.30, 4 o'clock, and including dinner, we will have a special session. This is what was scheduled for back in May, uh, a time of equipping and training in both conflict management um, how might I say this, skills and also equipping us for change. This is Greg Davidson Lazakovitz is a consultant who is serving our church and this will be his time with us to give us guidance and counsel and training on some wonderful things. September 11th, Sunday afternoon, think four o'clock until seven o'clock with dinner included. Please reserve that on your calendars, all church members and friends of this congregation to be there for that. Thank you in advance, and I just want to make sure that is a well-attended and wonderful time. Those are all the announcements I have for us today, church. Welcome again to this time and this place. I invite us as we move more fully into worship and turn our attention to the Lord. Will you please rise as you are able 
as Beth Ann leads us in the call to worship. God calls us. Do we listen for him? Sometimes his voice is like a whisper, hard to hear with all the noise around us. We are listening, Lord. God calls us. Do we want to listen? Sometimes I'm afraid God will call me to do something that I've never done before, something that's outside of my comfort zone. God calls us. We will trust and be willing to step forward in faith, knowing that God is leading the way. Please join me in the invocation prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you have given us so much and only ask in return that we follow you. It can be hard to hear your voice over the many other voices bombarding us each day. It can be hard to determine if the message is really from you. It can be hard to obey when you are asking us to do something new. Help us to discern your call and be open to following your will no matter what. Amen. Please join us in singing hymn number eight, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Thank you so much, everyone. You may be seated, and I invite all the children to come forward at this time as Rebecca leads us in the children's time. I know we have more coming. Are they not coming? Okay, they are coming. While we're waiting for them, I love that you're sitting here, but can we come over here? Thank you, you look great over here. But now we're gonna come in the middle. 
Yeah, right there. Now, Kai, can you come down for the first step? Danielle, can you go up to the top step, please? Top. Top, top. I know we don't normally have you go to the top, but today. All right. Are they coming? I have something special for you today. You want to come? <laughs> okay. All right. So now, can you have a seat over here? Thank you. All right. And now they're going to come up and join us. Nope, they're running away again. Okay. Can you both head up to the top step? Yeah, you're part of both. Have a seat. Stand up. Have a seat. Do you guys want to come up? I have something cool. Look, we're playing a game right now. All right. Can you move this way a little bit? I'm sorry, Jay, for making you go all over the place. Can you come over here? Can you join us over here? What happens if I okay. Come over here. Last move. Perfect. Thank you for being flexible. What does flexible mean? What do you think of when you hear flexible? You can get real bendy. What else? If somebody says, we're going to do this, but now I changed my mind, we're going to do this, and you're able to do it, that's being flexible. Yeah. So thank you very much for being flexible. You know, parents sometimes do this. We say, hey, we're going to the zoo today. Woohoo! And then we wake up, and it's raining, and we can't go to the zoo. So we decide to go to the aquarium instead. It does sound like fun. But that is being flexible. You know who else sometimes does that? God. God sometimes says, I want you to do this. And just as you start to do it, he's like, oh, never mind. I think I want you to do this. Has that ever happened? Can you think of any time? Sometime when you're sitting in a group full of kids, and maybe somebody's not being so nice, do you think God might be nudging you to say, hey, can you tell them to be nicer, please? And then maybe he says, you know what? No, I changed my mind. I just want you to be a good friend to the person who is not having such a great day. So it's good to be flexible with God. And a creature that is very flexible is the sand dollar. So I learned this while I was at the beach. And thank you to everybody who filled in for us that we had beach COVID um, last week. We appreciate that. So while I was at the beach, I was thinking of all of you. And then Pastor Joel told me this week we're talking about being flexible with God's calling. And a sand dollar, I did not know this until I researched, they sometimes live in packs, but every so often they feel like they're called to move away and live by themselves. Yes. And so they're flexible. And sometimes they feel that they need to just go over to this place, but nobody goes with them. So they're flexible. So then I have this story about the sand dollar. And you're each going to get a sand dollar so that you remember this. It is not. The legend of the sand dollar. Here's a lovely little story that so many men will tell of the life and death of Jesus etched upon this lonely shell. If you look at it real closely, you will find an image here of four nails and then another from a Roman sharpened spear. One side shows the Easter lily with its center as a star that shine brightly for the shepherds as they traveled from afar. And the Yuletide poinsettia painted on the other side tells us Christ was born on Christmas to wear our cross until he died. If you break the center open, you will find the sign of peace. So I broke one of these. 
What is the sign of peace? A dove. So there are five doves in each sand dollar. Five white doves in gleaming beauty. Will its wonders never cease? So you see the simple story. Jesus lived for you and me to carry on his work on earth to love humanity. So I have a sand dollar for each of you. Be careful, they are fragile, so they will break and you will get doves. You don't, honey. Okay, and now can we pray together, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you come amongst us and help us be flexible so that maybe instead of running with the crowd, we might separate and do your will. In your holy name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for coming up. I'll see you next week. I'm going to take this to your brother. Thank you so much, Miss Rebecca. Thank you, children, for joining us for this special time. I hope you were all enriched and received a portion of our message today. Hold on to those thoughts for later. Church, I call us now to the time of prayers of the church. And I lift before us uh, some, some requests and concerns that are before us. I ask you to not only hold them just now as we pray, but in the week to come. Please remember these people and situations in your prayers. It is with regret that I, I let us all know Dear sister, Joanne Kleindienst passed away early this morning. She had been extremely ill with declining health these last few weeks, and she has now passed on to be with the Lord. So re please remember Joanne, be grateful for her life and her faith, and hold her children, Matt and Lisa, in prayer, especially this week. I don't know anything yet about services, but I'm sure we will have a service here within the coming week or two. So please uh, stay tuned. But Dear Joanne Kleindienst has passed away. I also lift up several of our people who are struggling mightily with some illness and situations. Please remember Anita Jacobs, who is, has multiple cancers in her body. She is not pursuing treatment. She is living and doing very well at the moment at the Brethren Home in good spirits, but know that she has cancer and is choosing not to undergo treatments for them. So Anita Jacobs. Remember Amy Dietrich, who is still recovering well from a double mastectomy a few weeks ago. She will be starting radiation treatment this week. And so pray for Amy for endurance. I believe it's five days a week for five weeks. She will have radiation and hopefully has a good bill of health after that. But we will see. Prayers for Amy and family. Remember as well John Minnick. Many of you know John, although we haven't seen him in quite a while. He has bone cancer and will be starting some immunotherapy treatment shortly. So prayers for John and his son Mark and daughter-in-law Mary who care for him so well. I also lift up Edna Mooney who is the mother to Patricia Carey. She has had COVID in recent weeks and is 97 years old now in ill health to begin with. And so prayers for Edna for strength and recovery. Prayers as well for Rebecca Wolf and family, her father Fred has been struggling in recent weeks but is now having dialysis and doing fairly well. Rebecca also had some diagnosis of, uh, I don't want to call it the wrong thing, uh, something removed from her leg, from her skin. But so far the results look not so bad. And so we're grateful for Rebecca and pray for her continued health and that of her family. Prayers as well for Scott Bowman, who was husband to our secretary, Karen. He will likely need more surgery on his colon, so that is something very uncomfortable. Prayers for Scott going forward. I also have a request for someone named Landon Farley, a 16-year-old boy who was recently diagnosed with Crohn's disease. I don't know who this comes from, but remember young Landon and pray for him these days. 
Finally, a word of gratitude and, and thanksgiving. Let us pray for the National Youth Conference of the Church of the Brethren, which happened this past week in Fort Collins, Colorado. I, am, I have heard from various sources that it was a wonderful and inspiring week for so many youth from our greater Church of the Brethren all around this country. And I pray that we just give thanks for that experience for so many of them and pray for their spiritual depth, their commitments, and for all who have led them and that that whatever they have gained from that enriching experience would last. So let us pray out of gratitude for them. Church, those are the requests before us. I invite us, as we enter prayer, let's take some moments of silence. Please lift the prayers of your hearts, after which I will share the prayers of the church together. And as we conclude this prayer, we will go right into our anthem, our special music. As Christine and Becca play, it is well with my soul. So let that be the conclusion, a reminder that all is well with our soul as God dwells in us and among us. Let us come before the Lord Church in prayer. O oh, holy God, we come before you this day in prayer, lifting to you the joys and concerns, the hopes and the dreams of our lives. May we be open to your leading in us and among us. May we see and hear your call and follow the direction you would have us go. Bless, O oh Lord, this gathering of your people. I pray that we would grow and flourish in your love and grace serving the purpose to which you have called us. Hear our prayers this day for those lives who have touched us, those we know and those we love, some who are in pain, some who are ill, some who grieve, even some who are no longer with us in body, and yet we are grateful to have known and will always love. Lord, grant for us a special glimpse of your ultimate goodness. Work of renewal to those who need it most just now. May we enrich the lives of those around us, both through our prayers and also our actions and our lives. Guide us and form us and hold us as we are your children, called to do your work in the world. Lord, we pray not only for our own desires, but that your will be done among us, across this wonderful world. Grant us enough, O oh God, to sustain us. Give us enough for today, and show us what is ours to do. What mind we are to have as your followers. Keep us thirsty for your spirit's movement, opportunities in which your love might shine through us. Lord, we know and we trust and we believe that you hear our prayers, those spoken and even those hidden in our hearts. No matter the strain or the comfort in body and mind, see that our souls are attuned to you. Awake to whatever new thing that is before us. We pray all of this with confidence in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.
Thank you, Christine and Becca. Please join me in, in looking at the scripture for this morning. We have three scripture readings. The first is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 to 21. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so they might declare my praise. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 to 17. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The wedding guests cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloak, for the patch pulls away from the cloak and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. Otherwise, the skins burst and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. And finally, from Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Thank you, sister. Thanks be to God for these words of scripture and for the living word who is Christ Jesus the one who has conquered death itself and is forever God with us. Oh, church, once again, it's great to be back here preaching before you again this week. As grateful as I am for those who served in my absence, I have missed you. And I have every intention of being here consistently going forward. I hope to be faithful to my calling as you are faithful to yours. But church, what does that mean? What is faithfulness, really? The message today is my attempt to maybe challenge some common notions of what it is to be faithful, as in committed and loyal, with a reminder that God is alive, and therefore calling us to change rather than stay the same. Many of you know that almost a month ago I was away on vacation, I traveled to the state of Colorado and was able to attend a concert near the city of Denver featuring Blues Traveler. You ever hear of them? It's a band that was popular in the 90s. Uh, they really haven't written much music since then, but they keep on playing shows, and it's a really great time. Heavy on the harmonica, if you're into that. Otherwise, steer clear. But I'm told that they play every July the 4th in Denver, Colorado at Red Rocks Amphitheater. So it was quite a treat to see them there. It's become a Colorado tradition, okay? There was this guy sitting in the row in front of us, and he had on this T-shirt with the band's name from their tour in the summer of 1994, which is when their first album came out, and they were a big deal. It had the dates and the cities listed on that T-shirt. Blues Traveler, 1994, the first one, July 4th, Denver, Colorado. Isn't that great? 28 years ago, and I said to those with me, I said, that dude is faithful. 
a t-shirt 28 years old, and it still looked like new. Thought it was fun. Any of you ever hear of the uh, Old Faithful, the geyser in Yellowstone National Park? It's known for its frequent and predictable eruptions. It spews water about 100 feet in the air about 20 times per day. Intervals vary a little bit in between, but it sure has been consistent, thus earning the name Old Faithful. I've been privileged to know many adults, many of whom are in this room today, who have been married for well over 50 years, some as many as 65. Say what you will about the quality versus the quantity of years, but these people are faithful to each other, evidenced by a commitment. They have kept their promises to each other and been fortunate to survive. What a blessing. And yet there remains something different about the notion of faithfulness when it comes to God that I invite us to consider. There's something more than just consistency, as you might find in someone who works the same job for 40 years or cheers for the same baseball team for 70 years. I once met a man who told me that he ate the exact same breakfast every single day for 40 years of his life. Guess what it was? Plain oatmeal, like oats dry with a spoon every single day for 40 years. I mean, that is faithfulness to a practice. It may or may not be commendable. But the way we define faithful with things like that, I suggest, is different to, from our commitment to God. And here's why. We all might confess that God does not change, and I will always profess Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But one thing is sure, God often changes things. And while the, while the faithful people should not try to change God, it is God who very much wants to change us. God interrupts, reverses, shakes up the order of things quite often, actually. The whole pattern of faith as understood in light of Jesus Christ is that we are to die to our old selves and be raised to new life. Not just once, but constantly discerning God's will and then doing it. Quite literally changing our minds about things as God may lead us, which is what it means to repent and be reborn. The commitment we make is that we will stay engaged, stay focused and attentive to God's work and God's ways, not being tossed to and fro by every wind and doctrine or every fad or temptation. And yet, we must be willing to move when the Spirit says move, as the song goes, because God is at work making all things new. I want to get into our scripture reading a little bit today. And these are only several of many passages from our Bible that speak of God's desire for newness and change. They represent profound moments in the grand narrative when the people of God needed to be told about God's work to change and renew things that was coming. Be it their path toward restoration, their practices or even beliefs, or the very fabric of all creation. Isaiah chapter 43 is an oracle that would have teased its ancient listeners a bit, evoking memories, I don't know if you caught them, but of God's deliverance for their people in the past. Memories evoked by this language that recalled crossing of seas, drowned armies, water to drink in a parched wilderness. These are memories of the exodus that Isaiah 43 recalls. God's grand liberation of and leading a people to a new land out of slavery toward a hopeful future. Dramatic change, of course, but wait. The future did not entirely last. Isaiah 43 is written for people in exile, remnants of a divided nation which was later conquered by Babylon hundreds of years after that exodus. 
and the prophet's words invite its listeners to not remember the former things or consider the things of old. Isn't that wild? Quite often the scriptures tell us, look, remember what happened with your ancestors. Here Isaiah says, forget that. God is about to do a new thing. Forget the past, look forward. God's faithfulness almost always is bringing about new things. Fast forward to Jesus. As we heard in Matthew 9, in Jesus' own time and place, he was approached by some disciples of this prophet that preceded him, and who we call John the Baptist. And these disciples of John the Baptist were wondering about the practices of these Jesus followers. Why do you do what you do? Why don't you fast like we do? Why aren't you like the rest of us super religious folks? And Jesus, Matthew tells us, used this moment to teach a lesson. He said his presence was like being at a grand wedding reception. He said, my people feast when I am with them. Imagery of a wedding banquet. Unless someone really wanted to dishonor the bridegroom, everyone at such an occasion would feast together in celebration rather than refuse to eat. Jesus went on to say, there will be times for fasting, times in which we may sense our Lord's absence and wish that God seemed closer. There will be times for lament and recalling brokenness. And yet Jesus insisted, do not put patches on worn fabrics or new wine into old wineskins. That's imagery for putting something fresh into a deteriorating package. I have this memory of playing t-ball when I was like a first grade kid. And I, because I would often like dive on the ground and crawl and slide into bases and so forth, I got holes in the knees of my jeans. So my mother would like get these iron on patches of denim and like iron these things on. I mean, no one ever called me out for having holes in my jeans. Holes in the jeans are normal for kids. No one ever called me holy jeans. But my mom thought these needed fixed, so she'd iron on these patches. And wouldn't you know it, they'd always peel off at the corners. Within a couple days, they'd be like falling halfway off, and the coaches would be like, hey, hey, patches, throw that ball over here. Like now they noticed. It was worse. It was worse. Either get new jeans or let it be. Putting something fresh in with the deteriorating package or putting a fresh patch on a deteriorating item might just spoil them both. Both the contents and the container. Old skins would burst if new wine were put in them. If God is giving us or showing us something new, we, the vessels, must be flexible enough to contain it and put it to good use. Huh? Are you with me, church? Having faithfulness toward God implies flexibility. Willingness to be shaped by what God puts before us. It is an invitation to something new, not simply what has always been done. I admit that for years, when I was younger especially, I believed that the Christian faith was a calling to kind of live in the past to preserve what was old and resist what would be new, to stay the course rather than change, and to only do so reluctantly and with proper justification. Church, I am finding, and I hope that you are as well, that no follower of Jesus can truly remain in him without a willingness to be moved, to be shaped, to be formed. We are to die to our former selves after all. Our immature and ignorant selves, yes, our shadows and our failings, so as to be born again and again in Christ Jesus. That's how God works. God pours out the Holy Spirit. God makes God's self available to people, and we either receive that Spirit wholeheartedly or we do not. Faithfulness Faithful discipleship 
implies that we continually discern God's will and do it, even if it means doing something new, especially when it means doing something new. Book of Revelation, from which we've heard a brief section, records a vision that came to a man named John, an apocalyptic dream of epic proportions, something meant to unveil God's reality by fully embedding it in symbols and often deep irony. That's what this wonderful and often misunderstood book that we've heard today is all about. That's what it is doing. Much of it might disturb the average reader, but I remind us it does indeed have a climax, a most important sentiment right near its end that I remind us to hold on to. That's the portion we've heard today. This writing, as I think most of you know, came decades after Jesus had walked the earth and died and been raised. Many decades later, this revelation came to John and was written. It's about the future, and it's about the present, and it's about the past, all at once. There is a vision named, in chapter 21, of the new Jerusalem descending from heaven to earth with God upon a throne speaking to what was taking place. And in this grand symbolic event, God is taking residence among people, literally tabernacling with them, assuring them of a mutual presence with them. I will be your God, you will be my people, we will dwell together. Note that it's a city, not a garden at the ultimate end. And there is an assurance that every tear will be wiped from every face, death and mourning and pain will be no more, for those first things will have passed away. It's both a future promise and a mention of what has already been done. God is not taking us away so much as God is coming near to dwell with us, centered in worship and the healing of former pain. And then follows maybe the most important divine statement of them all. Verse 5. See, I am making all things new. Do you catch that godly imagery? I am making all things new. That's present tense, everyone. God is at work as we speak, has been since before any humans even knew it. As has been said by some of the keenest of biblical scholars, note that God is making all things new, not all new things. God's work is restorative, transformative, always revealing. God brings forth newness from the good creation, not apart from it. There is indeed biblical imagery that follows this, if you read on in chapter 21, that fire is coming, fire to cleanse, refine, and remove that which has no place in God's new creation. That's all fine. It's not at the center of what we are promised. In fact, Judgment is God's alone and never ours to wield. Verse 6 of Revelation 21, which immediately follows our reading, says, To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. When all things are becoming new, the ones renewed are still called to come and drink from the water of life, to receive what God is still offering and to put that refreshment to good use. There is the value of things like faithful worship, study of scripture from where we stand, commitment to regular prayer, fellowship with the whole church. Drink often the water of life and you will live out your calling, attuned to God's spirit. Do not do these things just because I said so, but because they lift up your life. And God who is near will be one whom you come to know, to recognize, to follow more closely than you used to. God is always out ahead of us, you know. 
God is on the move, alive, and eager for us to follow. God goes before us, friends, looking to lead us into what is coming. Our whole church, and this gets into the heritage part of our series, the whole church's story is one of change. Responding to changes in our world and in response to the Spirit of God moving. If you trace our several hundred year history of the Church of the Brethren, everything from how we dress to what music we bring to our worship, to support for higher education and even an openness to full participation in ministry and mission work, both near and far, our church has always been adapting and been moving sometimes slowly, sometimes rather quickly, but open to God's leading. The framing of change is interesting, though, and I'll stay with me. This is not a faithfulness to change itself, nor a faithfulness that is against change, but a faithfulness in change. If God is doing a new thing, which I believe God does quite often, we are to move with God aligning with God's purposes for humankind. If there is a need to break with the social and religious establishments of our day, then so be it. Let's go and let's do it together. Awake and aware of why and how we must live in light of a loving God who seeks to renew all things. Friends, there are plenty of terrifying obstacles to such faith in this world. Don't let me come across as naive here. Dangers of disease, war, poverty, and unpredictable economic systems surround us. There is a changing climate in this world which will likely harm generations to come. There are political movements, including some dangerous religious sentiment that corrupts both the church and the state at once at times. There is unhealthy nostalgia for times gone by. I remind us we are to be faithful to God alone, Jesus Christ as our center and guide, and not get swept up in any violent or any idolatrous notions that tickle our ears. You are the followers of Jesus Christ. Nothing else takes priority over that. That is true faithfulness. Romans 12 puts it, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Be open to change, friends, always, to renewing because God desires it, but let it be according to the love of God, the one who desires to restore and make all things new. The one who seeks the healing of the nations, the fullness of life born from the spirit and born from repentance. So let us be faithful, sisters, brothers, to the living and the moving God who does not change, but always desires to change us. So every day is one of new possibility one that may bring new beginning, fresh hope that God is among us, with us, and for us. Please never forget that. As long as we live, let's live faithfully, willing to be filled and shaped and molded by the love of God, having the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, and always thirsting for the water of life. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Joel, for planting the seed that we can be faithful and flexible and do something new all at the same time. In a couple weeks, choir rehearsal will be beginning, and I would just like to take this time to invite anybody who's ever thought about it to please come join us or reach out to me or email me and let me know that you would be like to come. And then we also have bell choir beginning in September. So uh, again, Please come join us, try something new, and thank you to those who have been faithful with that. Now would you please stand and join in the hymn of response, number 640, This is a Day of New Beginnings.
Be seated. All that we have belongs to God. As we celebrate our unity as a community of faith and focus our hearts on discerning God's will, we joyfully lay our offerings on the altar. Through the grace of God and the bounty of this church, we have the ability to share our gifts so that all may have what they need to live. We thank God for the opportunity to truly be in fellowship with one another and with the world through our offerings today. Will the ushers please come forward? Generous and surprising God, when we thought that death had claimed your only son, you amazed us with resurrection. Surprise us again with your ability to turn your offerings into gifts that will transform the world through our witness to your love. We lay our very lives at your feet, O oh God, knowing that you will use us to proclaim the gospel. Amen. Please join now in the sending hymn, page number 86, Now Thank We All Our God.
Church, go now from this service of worship to the service of God's people near and far. Refreshed by the living water that Jesus offers to you, listen for the parched voices of the least. Search out the dry places and arid souls and become for them a spring of living water. And as you go, may the blessing of the God of life, the Christ of love, and the spirit of grace be upon you this day and forevermore. Amen.